I wish you a very happy Christmas. The 12 days of Christmas operate from Christmas Day onto the great feast of the Epiphany. And the panel that you see on the right hand side of the screen is a small selection of the Christmas cards that I have received this year. I think that Christmas cards are very important. First of all, the personal message that we've received from loved ones. But secondly, the image itself. Sometimes we uh, are so busy that we overlook the message and the visual. So I'd like to invite you for the 12 days of Christmas to uh, dwell and pray about the images that will appear on the screen. I recommend that you use two, two slides each day uh, for the 12 days. And I think there are 25 slides altogether. So there's a, enough for each day of the 12. L look at the, the image and listen to the, uh, the prayer or the reflection that I will use drawn from a rich resources that I've used over many years. So I will be with you praying and praying for you and wishing you a very happy Christmas with blessings for the new year. This is taken from a great friend of mine called Joyce Roop, who is an amazing spiritual woman and writes beautifully. And this prayer is taken from a book of hers called Prayer Seeds. And it's called A Christmas Prayer, ideal for Christmas Day or the day surrounding it. Emmanuel, come to us. You chose to come for each person, the destitute and the wealthy, the unfortunate and the privileged, the troubled and the peaceful, the healthy and the ill. You came in human form with a message of extravagant love, showing us how to be with those who have much less than we do. You came offering a gesture of respect and reverence instead of indifference and disdain giving courteous kindness in place of thoughtless disregard, contributing ongoing support rather than a mere holiday handout. Change my heart, turn it inside out towards the larger world. Remind me daily of those who struggle with their basic existence, lead me to help change social systems that contribute to this ongoing struggle. Enlarge my awareness, increase my generosity, guide my choices of how I live, what I purchase and how I use my material wealth. Remind me often of your presence in those I tend to ignore or forget. Boundless love. Thank you for cherishing each person in your planet. Amen. This little story for today is taken from a book by John Quinn called Moments, and it's entitled A Summer Christmas. It had been a horrific time. In December, she had fallen down stone stairs and broken her neck. Three months in hospital, her head encaged in an awful metal halo. No sooner out of hospital than her sister died suddenly. A long road to recovery. And to make up for Christmas spent in hospital, I would bring her for a week to Kelly's Hotel in Rossdale. 
June the 25th, 2001. A summer Christmas. Our first day in Kelly's. A warm, humid day. The sound of the surf as we relax in the hotel garden. Contentment. An enjoyable lunch together. Back to the garden, relaxed, no need to have a conversation. Good to be here. Christmas Day. Champagne for dinner tonight. Late afternoon, she decides to go for a swim in the sea. I take her by the hand and guide her down the steep stone steps. Watch from the June sands. She enters the water. She splashes down and begins swimming. One, two, three strokes. So proud of her after all the trauma of the last year. I expect her to wave in triumph, but then there's nothing. Head stays down in the water. Trouble, or oh Jesus, trouble. No, please. I race into the water and drag her out. Others arrive, a doctor, a lifeguard, and they try to reach the suscitator, her, but it is hopeless. I look at the limb body, the beautiful hair, bedaggled and matted with sand. She is gone. Others comfort me, but I am none, not none. I have known her for 35 years. How the ultimate moment of horror is here. My wife and the only love of my life, Olive McKeever, lies dead on Rosslare Beach on Christmas Day in the summer. Back to my friend Joyce Roop, taken this time from another book of hers called The Cup of Our Lives. And she invites us to openness. Spirit of freedom, open my mind and my heart. Lift the barriers, unbind the strong grasp of my demands. When I want everything to go my way. God of spaciousness, reach into my inner space. Sweep out all the old clutter. Enlarge my capacity to receive. Bringer of truth, empty me of whatever impedes the growth of our relationship. Help me to recognize and accept your sources for my growth. Creator of the seasons of life. Soften my resistance to emptying. May I welcome each inner season as a catalyst for my transformation. Faithful friend, deepen my trust in you. Ease my doubts, fears and discouragements. And when I'm feeling vulnerable, remind me that you are my safe haven. Divine mystery, 
May I ever be more rooted in you. Draw me into peacefulness. Entice me into endless encounters where I can experience openness with you. Holy Whisper, open the ears of my heart. May I hear your voice within the silence, as well as within the noise of my life. Reawaken me so that I can listen to you wholeheartedly. Bringer of good and giver of growth, we yearn to be open and receptive to your generosity. May we trust your presence among the cycle of emptying and filling. Amen. If you look at the image on the right of the screen of the Holy Family, uh, one of the things that strikes me about this particular Christmas card is the love between all three people. Between Mary and Joseph, and even the baby, you can see him, especially in his eyes, responding to that profound love. In the book of Proverbs, there are some profound sayings, and I often refer to it, but I also forget it sometimes. So in the case of love, here are a few things for this day. As the north wind brings rain, so a gossiping tongue leaves a storm. A great woman is like a merchant ship which provides provisions from afar. A wise child is a father's joy. A foolish one is a mother's heartbreak. I love them. Better a crust of dry bread in peace than the discord of a house full of feasting. Entrust all you do to Yahweh and your plans will be realized. Amen. As well as the book of Proverbs, the Psalms are ancient prayers. And one Psalm 125 is one of my favorites. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said, among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord indeed has done great things for us, and we are glad. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the watercourses of Negebe. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. He that goes forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. To the last day of the year, and I'm going to say goodbye to the old year by using uh, a poem by a lady called Josie Whitehead. And she writes this. 
the old year makes his exit now as the curtains gently falls goodbye to sadness and to joy and to worries large and small he walked this earthly path with us through seasons of the year he shared our days of happiness and those that caused us fear we welcomed him with pealing bells he shared our lives with pride he saw rivals to our world and stood by those who died he beheld our world in springtime and shared our summer days then autumn came with golds and reds that turned our world ablaze December came with wintry winds and Christmas nights and cheer. But this year knows it soon must leave and let it be New Year. His time for earth seemed very short and now he must depart for the year has gone full circle round and a new year soon will start. Welcome to the new year, and I hope that you'll have many blessings. In many ways, a new year is a new beginning. There's a new road ahead. And going back to my friend Joyce Roop, she has also a book called May I Have This Dance? And she talks about roads and the way ahead and the road ahead. The road of faith that Sarah and Abraham travelled, trusting that even in their old age, God still had some marvellous plans and surprises in store for them. The road to forgiveness. This last of Jacob's sons in the reconciliation with their brother Joseph. The road through the wilderness as the Exodus people travelled to the promised land. God's presence never failing them. The road of justice courageously undertaken by Esther who risked her life and saved her people from destruction. The crowded road to Bethlehem. Vibrant life, ready to burst forth in a young mother's womb. The star marked road of the wise ones. A road that could be travelled only in darkness. The desert road where Jesus met his own struggles and came back with the power of the Spirit in him. The road of the prodigal son, too tired and hungry to do anything except return to the one place where he was loved and where he knew love. The Galilee road with the burdened bodies and the broken spirits felt the touch of compassion through Jesus. The road to Jerusalem, pain-filled, agonising, with its many moments of loneliness and rejection. The road to Bethany, where the comfort of friendship and love eased the demands of a turf journey. The road to Gethsemane, with its torment and agony, where a desire to turn things back pressed painfully upon the heart. The road to the empty tomb, where the promise of God filled the morning with light. 
The Road to Emmaus, I love the story. Travelled by two sad and discouraged disciples who are transformed by a blaze of love. Retracing their feet, hurrying to tell the good news. The Road to Conversion, where Saul became Paul and where love was surrendered to in mighty shape and form. Amen. The following are blessings for the new year and again taken from Joyce Roop and from her book May I Have This Dance. A New Year's Blessing. May your inner vision be transformed so that you can see more clearly your own journey with all humankind as a journey of peace, hope and love. May your God be somebody you can lean on in your weak and painful moments. May you know God in your work, your shelter, your strength, your wing of comfort and support. May you be aware of all the places your feet carry you in the new year. May you know how beautiful are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. May you not be afraid of the questions that press upon your mind and your heart, especially during the pandemic. May you welcome the questions and wait patiently for the day when you will receive your answers. May you be the one with welcome in your smile and a hello itched upon your hand, the hand you extend to everyone who blesses you with presence. May yours be the gift of reverence for all created things. May you face bravely and enthusiastically the responsibility to preserve and care for the beauty of the earth. May the wellsprings of compassion flow deep within you until you can taste the tears of your brothers and sisters. May you be awake each morning with thanksgiving on your lips and honesty in your heart recognizing all that is gift, all that is blessing. May your life this new year be a living legacy to your God. Amen. Father Andrew McMahon, who is the priest in Park Place, sent me in his Christmas card the following prayer. Lord, I promise I will not run away, not give up, not stop praying, even when it seems all useless, pointless, and a waste of time and effort. I want to let you know I love you, even when I feel unloved by you, and I hope in you, even though I often experience despair. Let this be a little dying. I can do with you and for you as a way of experiencing some solidarity with the millions in this world who suffer far more than I do. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. The Christmas card on the right is the work of a chap called Harry Clark. Harry Clark was born in Leeds 
and his father sent him to Chartres in France to learn the art of stained glass work. And he learned it beautifully, he became famous uh, in Ireland, in the UK, with stained glass windows all over the place. And I want you to notice the hands, especially in the artwork on the left panel. The hands are very strong, very powerful, and very long. So this is a prayer that I've used often, praying with your hand. First of all, pray with your thumb. It's the nearest to you. And so pray for those who are closest to you in life, your loved ones. The next finger is the pointing finger. So pray for those who are teaching, those who instruct, those who point out the way. Pray for healers. And that includes all kinds of people who work in our national health. The next finger is the tallest finger. And it reminds us of our leaders. So pray for our leaders, those in government, leaders in business, industry, and administrators. These are the people who shape our lives, <clears throat> excuse me, and shape our nation. The fourth finger is the ring finger. Surprising to many, for it in fact is the weakest finger. And yet it symbolizes love. So we pray for those who whom we love and those people who can pray for us. The last finger is the smallest, the little finger. So we pray for those people <clears throat> who are struggling in life, who are the smallest regarding stature or what they own or what they have. So praying with your hand. Amen. Pope Francis is a wonderful man for metaphors, and he writes this. Rivers do not drink their own water. Trees do not eat their own fruit. The sun does not shine on itself, and flowers do not spread their fragrance for themselves. Living for others is a rule of nature. We're born to help each other. No matter how difficult it is. Life is good when we're happy. But we're much better when others are happy because of us. We remember that pain is a sign that we're alive. Problems are a sign that we're strong. And prayer is a sign that we're not alone. If we can acknowledge these truths and conditions, our hearts and our minds, our lives, will be more meaningful, different and worthwhile. Amen. We are coming towards the Feast of the Epiphany. And I found this uh, reflection in a book called The New Sunday by Flor McCarthy for Year C. Christ's light was not lit once in Bethlehem and then extinguished. For 2000 years, his light has shone upon the world and it will continue to shine for all who believe in him and follow him. The light of Christ is a persistent light and has the power to draw people to its shining. It shines in the midst of disasters and upheavals. It is a defiant light 
which no darkness can overpower. Its purpose is not to judge us, but to show us the way to the Father and the Father's kingdom. God has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light, the light of his son, Jesus. We must live as children of the light. So let us imitate the wise men and walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. We talk about the adoration of the Magi, but this Christmas card has adoration in its very essence. And I'd like to invite you to be silent just for a minute to ponder the adoration that Mary and Joseph have for Jesus. Just join them in adoring. Praise God. In our prayers from home, the image on the left hand side, the adoration of the Magi, uh, was featured in one of our prayer evenings. And I thought I would include it uh, to talk about St. Francis of Assisi, who in the year 1223, invited the people from his village to gather for an activity and the farmers brought animals and there was a character with Joseph and Mary uh, and the baby and all kinds of different um, characters came and took part and Francis declared the gospel of the nativity. So ever since then Nativity scenes from across the earth have been built in different shapes and forms and paintings. And in many ways, that's what we've been doing in our prayer for the 12 days of Christmas. In the first uh, nativity, there was no room in the inn. But in many ways, ever since 1223, there is room for everybody to come in faith, to come in adoration, to come with love and see the birth of our Saviour. And as we make our final preparations for these 12 days, I would like, just like to invite you to remember that there is actually room in the inn for you and for everybody else. even though the inn might be falling down. This is an extraordinary piece of work. And I don't in any way, shape or form claim to understand the full significance of the richness. But I'm really captivated by the detail. And if the wise men had not followed their star, they would not have experienced such richness. And so with us. So follow your star, do not lose it. It leads to the path of righteousness. Follow the star, do not let it go. It gives hope to the saints. Follow your star, do not wait behind. It leads to the cross. Follow your star, do not look back. 
it leads to glory. Follow your star. Do not fear death. It gives eternal life. Follow your star. Do not doubt it. It leads to the Saviour. Amen. This is my favourite Christmas card. Now, I didn't receive it this year, but I received it from a friend of mine, Mary Huntley, many years ago. And I keep it on display in my office, and I've done so for years. And I call it the crib and the cross. There's a great variation in the front of the painting. It's springtime. The trees are in full bloom. And there's glory. And you've got the nativity scene. This is painted by a German female artist. Bente Haydn. And then she takes us on the road downwards. And then we climb up the hill, the hill of Calvary. And this part of the painting is winter. When you'd expect it to be springtime, Easter isn't spring always. So she's revert to the seasons. At the front you've got spring, and the back you've got winter. And the crib of the cross is very significant. First of all, the baby Jesus is in a coffin. And then you've got the cross way up on the hill. And then the amazing thing for me is the three people on the road. Now they could be the three women, the three Marys mentioned in the gospel. Or Matthew, Mark and Luke. Or indeed, James and John and Peter, they were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and they were with him also in Gethsemane. But I think the three people are us because we're part of the journey. 